start by introducing myself. My name is Andrew. Uh, in Dutch, they say Andrew Makinga. And um, I always make the joke, I'll make it one more time because they haven't heard it yet. It's, it, if you, it could go for an African tribe, Makinga, but, it, but it's just <laughs> as Dutch as cheese. But I always say that I'll never make that joke again, but that's how it is. I want to thank you all for coming here on a Friday night. <coughs> Who wants to go out on a Friday evening with your lover, your friend, your son, your neighbor, to discuss Africa in 2030. Well, here's your answer. Yeah, and that's, that's a good vibe. And I would also like a round of applause for our special distinguished guests from the continent itself. Yeah, our expertise from the motherland here. Oh. I would like to thank the Netherlands Institute for Multi-Party Democracy, NEMD, and uh, the Policy and Operations Evaluation Department of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, IOB, ICO, and the Sustainable Trade Initiative. They have all made this evening possible. Tonight, as I said, is the kickoff of Africa 2030. The kickoff means this is just the beginning. Um, a program that will highlight some of the challenges and opportunities of today's Africa. The first two themes that we will discuss are economic growth in relation to inequality and Africa-Europe's long-term relation. A difficult one. You only need to open the newspapers and read about the challenges that still go on today between these two continents. So tonight we, and that is something I would really like to uh, thank Ayan and Mark and the organizers for, usually they they get me to be like the magical Negro or the token African at this Africa event, but I don't know jack shit about Africa, except that I'm from Uganda. They took the effort to actually get the expertise in and you know, get tickets and ask people to come in and share their views. And that's, I would just like a round of applause for that because then we're not talking about them, but we're talking and listening to them. Please, please let's celebrate that. We'll have three sort of discussions. Uh, there will be room for you to ask some questions, but I, I hope you understand that, as, uh, that I'm also very eager to hear what they have to say so that there'll be more of a focus on them. And then at the end of each discussion, a bit of room for you to ask a question. Um, our first speaker today um, is a man of both worlds. As I said, we're dealing with Africa and Europe. He's the director of Up Africa Limited, a consultancy with the purpose of using jobs to drive Africa's development through private sector development, talent mobility, diaspora entrepreneurship, and public policy. He's also the co-founder of the London-based African Foundation for Development. Chukwu lives in London and Freetown, where he works as an advisor to the government. Could we give Chukwu Emeka a warm welcome? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. So thank you very much, Andrew, for that very warm welcome or introduction. Um, I was really excited for a minute there because he said I'm from the motherland. And then he went and told you that I'm also from London. So I don't think I have the same kind of exotic cachet that I would have had had I just given you the impression that I'm from the motherland. Um, <laughs> But I just flew in from the motherland, so I hope that um, you know, counts. Um, I'm really honored to have this opportunity to speak to you and um, to uh, share a few thoughts. Um, by no means is any one of us really an expert. Um, so I hope that we have this as, a, as an exchange and a, and a kind of sharing of thoughts. But I want to sh um, bring across three main points. So we talk about inclusive growth, and I'll want to touch on that, but I will want us to reframe the notion of inclusive growth. And then uh, I will want us to look at some of the underlying issues that I think we need to grapple with uh, as we think about Africa and 2030. And then I will really want to wrap up by looking practically and specifically at what I think are some of the things that we can do. And I'm really glad, as I look in the audience, I guess you all live here in the Netherlands. Most of you, I guess, live in the Netherlands. 
And I believe that there is a lot that we can do. So, um, on the issue of inclusive growth. Now, if you, I'm sure some of you, a lot of you, um, work in development, right? Uh, do some of you work on international development? You're involved in international development? Right, okay. So when you talk about inclusive growth, the first thing you think about is some sort of developing country, maybe the whole continent. It's a developing issue, right? Which it is. Um, we talk about inclusive growth. We need inclusive growth in Africa. But I want us to think about reframing that this evening. Um, I want to put it to you that inclusive growth increasingly matters to all of us. Because um, if I look now at the madness, we were just talking about the madness that is Brexit. The people who supported Brexit, apart from the, the billionaires and the, um, you know, the right-wing um, zealots, by and large are people who feel that they have missed out on growth, inclusive growth. They feel that they are the left behinds. If I think about that wonderful president in the United States of America, um, Mr. Donald Trump, and the kind of support that he has had, again, Many of the people, I'm not saying all of them, but many of the people that have supported Trump and, and still support, I mean, I can't believe the man still has 40% um, popularity of support. But many of them also feel that they are part of that left behind. My main point here is that inclusive growth, much as we tend to talk about it as an African issue, um, is a global issue. It's, it's, a, it's a problem for all of us. Um, and I think that is the way um, we ought to try and frame and think about this, this, this issue. And even if you argue that, well, there are high, the, the United States um, has record levels of job, jobs created, which is true, but look at the quality of those jobs. Increasingly, people are having to hold down two jobs, three jobs, just to make rent, just to make the basics. So the, the growth... Um, that we increasingly have is not inclusive. It's not inclusive enough. Um, and that is where we, we really, I think, need to think about when we're talking about Africa 2030. You'd be surprised why am I talking about inclusive growth being a problem for all of us. Of course, if we go back to the 1980s and the structural adjustment programs, um, this is where, you know, in Africa, it, indeed, this was the start, the roots of um, what we now call, talk about jobless growth and so on in Africa. But the point is that paradigm has been extended and is now something that we see increasingly across the world. So as we talk about inclusive growth, let's think about closer to home here in Europe. Um, definitely, if we look at different regions of the world, Europe is um, thankfully one of those where inequality um, actually is is not as intense. We haven't seen the 1% um, capturing such a huge portion of national wealth. So Europe is relatively doing well. And um, that's one of the points that I want us to get across, that there's something in Europe, much as we often criticize Europe and everything else that goes on here, there's something in Europe that is worth looking at and um, you know, working to, to, def to defend. Um, but so... First point, um, let's not cast inclusive growth as an African problem or an African issue, so that even when we start thinking about that narrative, we're already realizing that we're, this is one world and we're in this together. Now, if we talk about um, how to start to, you know, to, to address this and what, what, what is, should be a real concern for all of us, um, I would argue that the underlying issue here is inequality. Inequality and indeed um, taxation. And that if we really want to grapple with things like global um, poverty, we must take a much more serious look at inequality. And I'm drawing on some of the work from the, the World Economic, uh, the World Inequality Report uh, 2018, and the, which was put out by the World Inequality Lab, but I mean, there's a lot of literature around inequality. 
And inequality is um, something that, as I said, has an impact on global poverty. And over the last few years, countries have gotten richer, but the governments have gotten poorer because more of the wealth is being captured in private hands, often outside of the ambit of tax regimes. And um, without governments that are able to tackle uh, these problems, then we, we are going to have a bit of a problem. Um, so the, the issue of inequality linked to public, you know, what governments are able to do. And if we look at the projections beyond 2030, but to um, 2050, um, and we have different scenarios. If we look at sort of a business as usual scenario, uh, we will see inequality, global inequality uh, further increase. And in the, um, in the months and decades to follow, um, if we are not able to replicate, as I said, Europe is, is actually something of uh, an encouraging arena when it comes to the, the growth of inequality here in Europe has not been as, as high as in the United States and some of the other areas. So another scenario would be a sort of European scenario um, in terms of global in inequality. But rising global income inequality is not inevitable. And I think this is the key point because ultimately when we come down to what we can do, it becomes a political question. Um, and what we see within um, countries is the, the impact of um, inequality, ha you know, is, is very much, uh, sorry, the, the impact of global poverty is very much implicated by the questions around inequality. And just the figures around this, um, if we look at the more objective, uh, the more uh, optimistic scenario um, around inequality, we would see that by 2050, the income um, per household per, per year, per adult per year, ranges from 4,500 euros by 2050 to, to 9,100. So there's a big difference depending on which scenario of inequality we, we take. And again, tackling inequality is a political question primarily. And therefore, some of the policies that we really need to think about in tackling inequality, of course, we know that um, tax, educational policies, corporate governance, um, wage setting policies, these are all the policies that are important. So again, inclusive growth that we want to tackle in all around the world, including Africa, I'm bringing that home to you here um, in the Netherlands, in Europe, to say these are the issues that we need to deal with. The, um, the other aspects, of course, of, of um, tax, certainly as far as Africa is concerned, is capital flight. So since the, the 1970s, you've seen something like a trillion dollars flow out of Africa, which is, which is actually higher than the levels of, of, of debt and aid and so on. So, but again, the, the issues there in terms of addressing um, these uh, uh, flows are, are going to require policies and cooperation. So, the, 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 the issue of um, how we combat this is going to require um, African states, but also the European and, 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 and other partners to work on these, these issues. And increasingly, the issue of tax um, havens is a, a, an issue here um, in Europe. Um, the, the Apple company has just in the last um, few weeks being um, fined by the, the French uh, government for $571 million. And um, the European Union has also tackled uh, Apple on, on this question. So we are on common ground when it comes to d addressing issues of uh, inclusive growth by looking at what we can do and, and what we hear um, in Europe and in the African continent as well. So. Uh, if we move, if we look at, um, as I said, inc inclusive growth, something that's of concern to all of us, linking that to questions around inequality, linking that to issues around tax policy, I want to, the third area is, is really around what can we do? What do we do? What is that EU-Africa relationship and how do we work? And what can we all do? Because I'm not here to really give, you know, general kind of thoughts. I think there are things that we all can do 
um, as Europeans, as, uh, whether we're diaspora, uh, and whether we're based on the continent of Africa. And um, the, for me, the, the key issue is, is leadership. And it's not just the leadership in terms of the top um, leaders that we elect, it's also what we can do um, individually and collectively. But I think the, the, the real issue is, and the reason why I'm really emphasizing on the question of inclusive growth um, and, and how it relates to us here, is increasingly um, we are dealing with systemic challenges, complex systemic, systemic challenges that don't lend themselves to very simple solutions. I could easily have stood up here and talk a lot about projects, you know, projects we can do in Africa, um, but Increasingly, what we're seeing is these projects are not going to really have the impact that we would like unless we deal with some of these bigger issues. So that's why I'm coming back, you know, to, to this issue. So in terms of where and what we might do, I think, as I said, it's a political question. Um, and we're seeing the rise of the right wing here in Europe. Um, we have this uh, Africa... EU dialogue that happens. And one of the things that um, African states, African leaders need to do is to put on the agenda, because what we see in Europe is that whilst you have the ascendancy of the right, actually the, the more moderate parties are overcompensating. They are overreacting to what the right, the agenda of the right wing, and therefore sometimes even embracing the, the right wing's agenda in a way to supposedly forestall them. And I think that this is um, problematic because that is shaping the whole context within which Africa-EU relationship is unfolding. And therefore, one of the things that, that certainly African states need to do when they're having the dialogue with the, the, the AU and, the, and um, EU is to actually ensure and challenge their counterparts to not give undue prominence to right-wing parties. But what you all can do, if you're not doing it already, of course, is to support more progressive um, parties and a more progressive politics. If we don't have a more progressive politics, I don't think we'll be able to tackle things like inequality, tax, and indeed inclusive growth, which will, will have an impact, not just for Africa, but for all of us here in Europe. Um, and again, I think that um, Europe in this context is a relative success. So I think it's important um, that when we see the European Union under attack. Brexit is an attack on the European Union. Um, it's a political attack. But this is, is where a lot of the energy should be, be, be placed. And, and I think, as I said, I'm seeing a link between what's happening in Europe, the, the, the attempt to reconfigure politics in Europe towards the right as a threat, not just to, to Europe, not just to the, the advanced world, but of course to the prospects for development in Africa. Um, and so I think that we, we really need to place more emphasis on opening up that space for progressive politics. And um, generally speaking, the challenges that we face, and we've been talking about the leadership challenges that, that we, we face, um, we need to be dealing with issues that are much more complex. Karl Popper talked about cloud problems and clock problems. A clock problem is relatively simple to solve. Uh, it, you know, you know that the parts are, you figure out what, it, what needs to be done. Cloud problems are much harder, that you can't even define them, they're interrelated, they're complex, and therefore there's a lot need for more collaboration. We need to collaborate more in terms of how we address these issues and these problems, and um, in, in so doing, begin to define the, um, how we can really strengthen the networks, um, the leadership that we need, both here in Europe and also in Africa, to actually tackle these sorts of problems. So I want to just leave you that thought. I think, as I said, it's down to, I think we'll get into more of a discussion around the leadership issues um, as we proceed this evening. Um, but again, uh, for us to tackle in inclusive growth in Africa, we must deal with the issues of inequality. We must deal with taxation issues, all of which we can do from here. We can do projects in Africa, leave that to us. We'll try and do that. But we will not make success. We will not make progress until we deal with the issues here. Thank you very much. Chuku, you can have a seat. Thank, thanks again. Thanks again. Um, 
excuse me, sir. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Anybody have a question? Right. Don't do this to me tonight. <laughs> By the end of this evening, I'll see hands everywhere. But it's okay. I warned you. Chuku, as I, as I said, I, was, I am not the expert, and I know you're not the expert. I sat there having dinner with you guys, and I, it, it felt like I was back at school, which I never finished, which is a bad sign as well. Uh, there was so much information, variables, data, and looking at this from the perspective of inclusive economic growth, the Walter Rodney in me was wondering, what about the spiritual healing of the exploited continent by these Europeans who are now doing this again through the tax evasion? How can we grow if we don't heal first? I'm exaggerating a bit, but we need to... It's on, it's on, it's on. Okay. Um, well, I think we do need a holistic approach, and, um, if, and healing you know, can be part of that. But I think we need to move away. I think this narrative... I mean, we're not victims, um, and what I'm trying to say is that I think we have a problem. It's a shared problem, and, and the, the answer doesn't rely, I don't think, on sort of getting on a plane and flying off to do lots of projects in Africa. I think there are a lot of Africans who are doing that. There are people already there. I think that we, we need to evolve a language of collaboration, of, of collective interest in addressing these problems. We are, we, we, we got to get away from the idea, you know, Africa is a sort of the white man's burden, um, the, 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 the blighted continent, and all of these sorts of things. As I say, the issues that we're dealing with in Africa, if, we, if, we, if we're not able to resolve issues that are affecting Europe here and, and other parts of the world, yeah. we will not be able to deal with those issues. Yeah. So I think that's the, I mean, th there is a history, but we, we can end, end up getting, spending a lot of time um, in, in sort of Crying. finger pointing. Yeah, and pointing. And, and it, yes, and I think that um, we need to have a sense of our history, yeah. but we also need to realize that um, I mean, Europe is in a crisis as well, so we should also be healing, he healing Europe. Healing Europe. Yeah. No. <laughs> Need some healing. The reason I, I was exaggerating a bit is because it really sparked me and it made me uh, realize that it, even my own mind is a bit stuck in the old frames of thinking. We've had a long discussion in the Netherlands about aid or trade, which aid definitely lost. <laughs> I'm looking at whoever voted for whoever. Because that leads me to your next point, progressive politics. My God, we have gone so far to the right that there is no left anymore, if you could, if you could speak of that issue. So, honestly, how, without getting too political, do we get into a situation where that progressiveness, that inclusive thought, is also consciously aware in the minds of, of, of the Europeans, the Dutch, for example, here? Well, we have to get political. Uh, I mean, I think yeah, it's a political yeah. issue. So yes, and I, I, I do think that, um, I mean, what's happened is over the last, what, 50, 60 years, we have increasingly constructed development as something very apolitical. Yeah. And yet it is, it should be political, not partisan political, yeah. but it, it is about, it, and it does have, to your point about healing, it is about values. It is about what we believe in, in terms of equity and justice and all of these different things. Yeah. But I think that we have, to a large degree, retreated from that arena um, and we just want to, you know, there's a sort of way in which we're constructing development now as a sort of series of projects. Yeah. And I'm saying that the fundamental things about development are political. Yeah. And therefore, we, we do need to engage in local politics here yeah. um, and see that as part of the world that we want to see and, and, and evolve. Yeah. But, but then the tax evasion, for example, how are we going to do that? I've, I've, I've been thinking about it, and I, we all know it's going on. But nobody really, we don't, we don't get rid of it. Holland is one of the number one countries where we, you know, we facilitate this to happen. It's, it's not really changing. Well, I think it is changing. It may not be changing as fast as we like. Yeah. I think the fact, again, you know, in the 80s, um, when um, the IMF and the World Bank, the Bretton Woods institutions yeah. were imposing uh, structural adjustment programs. It was an African problem. 
But when it was um, imposed on the Greek, it, suddenly people begin to realize, oh, actually, no, this, this is not a just set of policies, or these are not the ideal, optimal set of policies. So we're more connected so, than we think. Yeah, and, and now that increasingly um, the issue of tax havens is now more on the agenda in Europe. So this is an opportunity to broaden that conversation and to begin to, it, you know, it, it's really a question of, of research to understand how, because most of the wealth now is not in sort of land, it's in financial securities, for example, which are much harder to trace. But it's a, it's a, it's a job to be done, you yeah. know, to get the information, you, you know, the Panama Papers, these sorts of uh, revelations that we saw in the last few years, you know, they're out there. So, so it's work, it's, that's what we need to do. Um, for me, as I said, the narrative about Africa is not let's go and save Africa, let's save ourselves, let's deal with these issues. To, to, before we go to the question, that's another thing. The other downside to the, the, that wrong narrative or the different narrative is that when you think of investing in Africa, a lot of people think about big corporations, tax evasions, while having dinner with you guys and listening to what you, you, you have to say, it's about way more than that. And, and there's a, there, there could also be a change in the minds of Europeans with regards to Africa as a place to invest. Small businesses, smaller investments, not necessarily the big multinational companies. How do we get there? Let me ask the audience a question. Um, there's a book by um, some McKinsey consultants out. How many, um, just shout out a number, how many billion dollar companies do you think are, that you, you find in Africa? Just shout out a number. How many billion dollar companies today what? are there in Africa? Oh, yeah, my, my, You've read the book? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> now, there's, eh, always, eh. there's always one in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You didn't hear her. No, no, no. Af yes. yeah. Okay, who else? Hopefully not, not everybody heard Wendy, but... Um. <laughs> well, 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 let's reveal. Yeah. Well, I mean, typically, in fact, what they say in the book is that most people don't go beyond 50. Um, and a few people say 100. And in fact, the only person who got the right number was um, Dangote, a look who, of course, himself has probably got about four or five billion dollar companies. Yeah. Um, but the actual figure is 400. And it, it's, it's quite a surprise to most people. It's not the perception we have. And by the way, I'm not saying that, you know, the answer lies in having billion dollar companies. It's just that the perception of Africa and the argument that the authors make is that the returns are very, very high in Africa, not least because competition isn't very strong often, but there are a lot of opportunities. Um, so we shouldn't certainly think in terms of the investors who, who actually look at um, opportunities and risks in Africa often overprice risk. And, and that means that the cost of capital is, is, is too high. So they have flawed perceptions, which is actually bad for them because if you're not investing in a place of opportunity, you're the one missing out. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a lot of work to do to sort of rectify those perceptions. Okay. Um, and so it's not just about small businesses. We, we do need to invest in small businesses because a lot of the jobs come from small businesses. But there's also opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to continue to talk about the inclusive economic development and uh, the way we can get that uh, inclusive growth. Um, I would like to introduce Stephen uh, Colette to the stage. Please have a seat. You can give him a round of applause. He is um, the executive board member of IDH, the Sustainable Trade Initiative, and they work together with companies and governments on chain diversion uh, by developing new business models for living wages, living incomes, and sustainable land use in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. He's also worked in Africa and Asia on change beyond aid through markets and society. Um, our other guest um, is the woman who just mentioned the 400. You've read the book. <laughs> Falspele, we say in Dutch. Um, she's vice chair of the DE, DAC e Evaluation Network. She's worked at various positions at the nexus of research policy making and policy evaluation. And she is the director of IOB, the Policy and Operations Evaluation Department of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Could we welcome <laughs> Wendy Asbe? I think uh, that was okay. Eh? Sounds like the queen. Yeah, you get the key. Uh, we can say Wendy. Yeah. Um, queen Wendy. 
I had a look at the report and the conclusions of the report, which was already a lot of pages. Um, it says, it's a very interesting report, if I can say. Um, it, it, I learned a lot by, by looking at it. Uh, <laughs> but could we get just like a little sort of like mini reflection of the most important points in that report before we continue the discussion from you? Um, like you, we were also interested in the issues of inequality and um, poverty. And uh, we be began to think about this already in 2013-14 because that's when these huge discussions globally um, uh, were conducted on inequality yeah. and the results of uh, all the perverse effects of globalization. Yeah. Um, and we, we concluded that although there were massive successes and massive successes have been reached in Africa in terms of improving all sorts of social indicators in education and so on, there is still the problem of people being left behind. Um, people still left in extreme poverty. And that is especially the case in countries with very low incomes uh, and countries which are, which are sort of at the bottom of, of development. So even there is this paradox of even though there is very rapid growth, there has been very rapid growth in Africa, it has been very unequal and lots of people have been left behind. Well, if you couple that with the prospects of, let's say, about an average of 3% population increase in Africa, then you really need to think about how do we um, take along these people in extreme poverty and how do we overcome the problem of jobless growth. Yeah. Uh, and so that is one of the things, or the main thing that our study uh, looks at. And then one of the conclusions of the report is, of course, that this is not a sort of donor issue. This is an issue, first and foremost, of uh, uh, African governments, of African private sector. And of course, there is also a little uh, a sort of a propelling role, perhaps, for donors. But it needs to be, um, I think, when, as we've studied, it needs to be uh, a targeted uh, approach, very much uh, with an eye to the differences in different countries in Africa, because Africa, although it is a oh. big continent, um, uh, is, is a range of 59 different countries, so it requires very specific, targeted uh, solutions. And one of the things uh, we found, uh, and lots of studies have confirmed this, is that you cannot really um, tackle the issue of extreme poverty without actually uh, raising productivity in agriculture. So agriculture, paradoxically, remains a very crucial sector. But there are also other opportunities, opportunities in tourism, opportunities in construction. So there are a lot of solutions. Um, but for the, for the most vulnerable groups and for the most vulnerable countries, and there are a lot of fragile states in Africa, you do need also uh, a government to step up and to uh, tar target these specific groups. And I fully agree with you uh, that um, this is not a, a specifically an African issue, and this is why the sustainable development goals are, are obviously so interesting. <laughs> Because the Sustainable Development Goals, the first goal uh, uh, focuses on relieving extreme poverty, but Sustainable <coughs> Development Goal number 10 also suggests that um, inequality within countries have to be reduced. And this is not just an African issue, it's an issue for all countries in the world. Okay. So that's the sort of message of that. Yeah. Now, we don't have all night. So gentlemen, Stephen, let's get to the point. You heard... <coughs> You heard her speak, you, you've had a look at the report. What's, what's your reaction? Are we, are we on? Yeah. Yeah. Are we on? Yeah. Yes, good evening everyone. Um, my reaction, well, if you want to make growth inclusive, you work with companies. If you work with companies, you deal with investments and markets and scale uh, and have, have an opportunity as you mentioned and there's also a risks. Um, what I learned from this report is that a lot of opportunity for reducing inequality and reducing um, uh, um, exclusion is in Af in still in, aqua in uh, agriculture and in processing of agriculture. So for me and from where I come from, looking at sustainable trade, that is something which we can work on together and which we do work on together, not only we as we sit here, but you all, because you're consumers of many products. So thinking through in one world what it means to be 
connected uh, in supply chains where we can actually make the supply chains work for less inequality would be my takeaway of this report. Yeah, well, I... Okay. Uh, uh, is it on? Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that exactly as you say, that um, the, the, the issue of inequality, I think we need it personally, I think we need a paradigm shift. I think there needs to be something where we, we, we recognize that the, the tax regimes that we have are perverse. Um, I mean, there was a, a congresswoman in the US who was actually saying, you know, why do we have billionaires? I mean, why do we have so many billionaires? We just take it as normal, but it's not normal, it's abnormal. Um, and, and, and so there's at one level, I mean, definitely we need to carry on doing what we're doing, you know, at the level of individual projects, trade, the fact that we all, more, more and more people want to actually consume products and know the, 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 um, the pedigree of the product and, and what happened, where they've come from and things like that. But I would submit that unless we get a more significant shift in the product, don't forget that, as, as you say, many of the countries where um, vulnerable people live are also fragile. The governments actually are very weak, and therefore to effect the kinds of change in terms of development that we're talking about is also very difficult. And it will take a long time. In the process, if we don't accelerate efforts around inequality, the, the chances are that the fragility will just actually self-reinforce and more and more countries will implode. So it, it's, there are a lot of um, challenges, and there's a lot that we can do. It, certainly in terms of the, the issues around um, inclusive, uh, I mean, or, or actually dealing with the economic opportunities, we need to take a more systemic approach. Most of the aspects, whether you talk about agriculture, whether you talk about fisheries, you talk about tourism, manufacturing, it doesn't matter which sector. When you have systemic problems, they manifest similarly across. And so it is true that we need to put a lot of energy into agriculture in many of African countries. But what tends to happen, especially in conventional development approaches, is really dealing with symptoms and not the underlying uh, causes. So again, um, this is why I still think that um, the, the need for us, when you talk about the EU-Africa relationship, it is for a much more collaborative approach we need systems leaders, people who can actually effect systems change. I am wondering, what happened to your recommendations in this beautiful report? Um. Sometimes politicians find ways of not making it disappear, but they shove it under the chair or the cupboard. To, to, what has been done? Did you speak to the Prime Minister? What did, what did his, his people tell you? I, I want to know something, what the process is that you're in now. Yeah. Well, I think one of, one of the... Um, it's, it's not the case that the report is completely ignored, um, but we also have to be, I think, realistic to the extent to which individual donors can, can achieve things um, on their own. I think we have to be more modest about that. Of course, the Netherlands are now trying to deal with the tax issue. A lot of European countries are also trying to advise uh, African governments on how to improve their tax systems. Um, there is a lot of there are a lot of initiatives. Uh, Stevens' initiative is one of them to to help propel the private sector, um, kickstarting it by uh, using government money as well as private sector money. So things are being done, but I don't think we should, should assume the paradigm of, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, that donors can ha actually help Africans to help themselves. Yeah. I think, um, talking of the issue of leadership, I, I mean, I, I forget the exact uh, 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 sort of indicator, but some, uh, some um, I think it's Brookings or something, in an interesting report about Africa 2030, suggests that if you get um, democratic transparency and global corruption indices in Africa up to the medium level in the world, then you would save billions and billions of money, something like $110 billion uh, annually. And that is about uh, uh, more than two times the amount that donors spend, can spend yeah. in, in Africa. So the key to all of this is also in Africa itself, and it's not just a, a matter of Dutch government policies or, or European policies. Of course, they can trigger and help things, 
Um, but I do think it has to come from Africans themselves. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Okay, so I'm, maybe I'm a bit of a practical man, but I'm, I'm challenged by my neighbor saying, uh, Chuku saying, oh, you, you need systems change, and I fully agree to that. And then the report saying a lot needs to happen in agriculture, right? So trying to connect this, just to sound this out, right? So if, if there is a need for a farmer, somewhere in the world, be it Africa, be it Europe, be it wherever in the world, to actually make her or his business work better, you need to be able to invest, right? Many are not able to invest. And there is a perception that this is a risky business. And at the same time, this business has been there for centuries. So to take out that perception, I think, is a sensible investment or an intervention. Because it's a system intervention, you actually work with, private, with the financial sector, with banks, to show them that this is not the risk they think it is. Because at the moment, many, many, uh, especially smaller farmers and their families have no access to credit and to services. And I think this can be uh, changed, and I know it can be changed because we work on that, through uh, working with banks to, to, to analyze the risk which they are now not willing to take and to prove it's not a risk as they see it. But, okay, we, we, we take away that perception, but how do those farmers get access to the international market then? I think many farmers already have that access, but they cannot, uh, they cannot use it in a way, uh, at least the farmers we work in through these supply chains, that they actually liberate themselves from being depending on one crop only, that they cannot add value, they cannot buy better seeds, uh, they cannot uh, prevent site selling because they need uh, money in bad times. So if they are more independent by, uh, by, by having more access to good services, they have better choice. And but they why, can become but why more can't productive. I get the small juicy bananas that I have in Uganda? Somebody told me that Chiquita lobbied for the length of a banana, therefore, and then the report that she writes, yeah, she says rightfully, the solution is in, is in Africa. But if we don't say anything, the banana will stay in Uganda or in Kenya or wherever it is. If you go to the Yumbo here, you, you pay, I think, a, a euro for a kilo's banana which is not a fair price, right? So talking about that, talking about the, the, the systems issues there, which is around wage, which is about pricing in the value chain, that's what I think the discussion we need to have. Is that what he also means with the pol political aspect of it on, on, on our side? Is the question that? to me or? No, I'm, I'm to, yeah, to, well, to you. Well, yeah, I think, I, I think you're fully right. It's always a political issue. It's always political. Who has a question? I have a question. Yeah, okay. Now we're talking. Hey. <laughs> um, I'm Alphonse Mwambi uh, from DRC Congo. So now I'm from The Hague. Um, I have the impression like we are in um, 50 years back talking about uh, these bananas in Africa, technical things. Uh, I remember that uh, the Premier Minister, uh, Mark Rutte, uh, uh, some days ago, he said, Macht is not a vis word. Uh, like, uh, having power is not dirty. So, I, I think that that uh, is the big problem. Uh, I don't know if there, there is a country in Europe who needs that Africa become development. I don't, uh, because when we see China, we want all of us combine uh, China, combat Ch China. We don't need that China become a big, big, big power. So my question is, um, what can we do from here to stop the governments, politicians who are supporting rebellions in uh, Africa, uh, killing people like Gaddafi, destabilize, uh, destabilizing uh, uh, countries there. I think that that the key is of uh, the problem we, are to, we want to, to, we will talk about. Okay. All these bananas things, I don't, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in it. <laughs> I didn't say, I didn't did the Gaddafi thing. I just uh, mentioned Walter Rodney. Uh, don't look at me. Who, who would like to answer? I thought you were going to take Yeah, I'll take a couple. So, so another question as well, then we can, we, we can do. Uh, 
Da, daar, ja, die meneer met de bril. Ja. Please Hi. let her hold the mic. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Shadi. I know I'm not African. I come originally from Yemen. But uh, I think the strongest, the strongest asset for Africa is its people. And uh, I think I've been one hour sitting in this uh, place and I don't understand what is the dream and the image for Africa 2030. <laughs> Thank you. But I think you should start by uh, painting what is the dream and the image that you want to achieve as an African people, uh, rather than playing the victim role uh, for a long time. True, history happened, but we need to move on. But nobody here is playing the victim, eh? That, that was Alphonse saying the killing of Gaddafi and... and yeah. So, I, so who do you I'm, mean I'm just, is playing the victim? I'm just, I'm not pointing hands. I'm just expressing in, in, uh, in Okay, in so Africa shouldn't be the victim. Yeah, That's because the, what is the first image that every time Africa has been mentioned is like poor children or sending shoes to it. Okay. And rather than what I think is Africa have a lot to offer and a big and like a, a bright, bright, beautiful picture than okay. what it have. Oh, okay, I, thank you. But just in defense of Chukwa, who, who started by telling me we need to get out of that same narrative, I thought you were saying the exact same thing, but maybe I'm, I didn't understand it. One more person, and then uh, the, uh, the lady in front. Oh, the, the, the red hair, yeah. Um, I've been coming to Benin in West Africa for uh, 10 years now, and I'm supporting a young uh, entrepreneur in uh, coconut oil. And what I'm discovering is that he is not getting much help in uh, de developing his, his, uh, his company. And m my spontaneous action by getting 10,000 uh, 10, euros from him from the Netherlands, which he has to pay back also. But if he, if he asks for money within his country, he has to pay 25% interest, which for him, uh, under no way he, can he develop his his uh, his, his, uh, his, his company, his yeah. business. Yeah. And another thing that I noticed is the lack of pride within the country to buy their own products. They rather buy rice coming from uh, from Thailand than their own Beninese rice, which is probably even better because they don't use as much herbicide. Yeah, thank you so much. What, should we do one more? One more? The gentleman there, next to Alphonse. Huh? Hi. It's uh, difficult to live here because when I came here, they asked me to speak Dutch. Now I have to speak English. But anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, thank you. Thank you. My name is Paul Bikai, and I have a question. Um, there are companies who are working in Africa, but they do not pay taxes. And when there is a government, how weak, how strong, asking to increase the taxes, we see that the government is having democratical problems. So I'm asking myself if IOB is advising, for example, the Dutch government, in order to make it possible that the companies who are working in Africa, they pay their share. That was my question. Okay, thank you. The name of the study is Transition and Inclusive Development in Sub-Saharan Africa at IOB. We have had a few remarks and questions. Um, feel free to uh, react. Not at all at the same time. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, react on, on the lady over there and, and the gentleman over there. Um, one of the things that we also stress in our report is um, it, it's linked to what you're observing is that, and also I think what Stephen is saying, that um, access to credit is a huge issue in, in, in many African countries. And uh, uh, banks, uh, private, private industry, uh, private banks, but also uh, governments can help small, small enterprises to, to, to obtain that access and therefore help them to develop. Um, you were also saying, I think very rightly, there is less, I mean, why not take more pride in home-produced 
uh, agricultural uh, products. Well, uh, lots of studies have shown that the agro-food industry in, in, in Africa ha can have a huge future, uh, and that will also help to reduce the dependency on, um, on imported food. So there, is a huge, there are huge chances there for, for Africa, because the growing population, of course, also uh, allows for this agro-food industry to develop uh, within Africa. But that does require good investments in all sorts of infrastructure. And that does require extra, extra money. But there are huge op uh, opportunities there. And, and many studies have shown that uh, uh, promoting agro-food industry for African consumption has a huge future. Um, the gentleman who suggested that IOB should help advise the government to, uh, to improve uh, or, or to actually stop countries from uh, dodging their, their taxes. Um, we, are, um, well, we are an evaluation service. We do some, some studies also with regard to, to, to let's say, future developments. Uh, but there have been a lot of, lot of um, people and reports that suggested how to do this. Um, and I don't think we need yet another IOB study to do this. Um, but we will be, be actually doing an evaluation um, in a couple of years, or we'll be starting this on, um, on the role of the Netherlands uh, and taxation, also vis-a-vis -vis countries such as Africa or, or, or continents such as Africa. But there are loads of studies already showing that if you want to uh, um, um, get rid of these negative practices, there are lots of measures that can be taken. But they have to be taken together with, of course, the African uh, uh, countries themselves. So I, I think um, on the question of the, uh, the, the destabilization of, of African governments, of course, it's not a new issue. Um, but it's, it is a political issue. And if we have this information, uh, again, um, you, the, the Dutch government, for example, development policy is a product of the government, the parties that you put in power. Uh, and if you can make it enough of an important issue, you can then affect certain amounts of policy shifts. All of the things we're talking about in terms of development are, are, are complex in the sense that development itself is not just about saving lives. It is also about the projection of interests um, and, and many other factors. But that said, it, it's, again, I, I mean, I said it earlier and I say it again, I believe that a lot of what we're talking about in terms of international development is a question of politics and choices that you make here. And, and it's not an overnight thing, but it's a process. And, and so I, I can only agree with you. Um, in, of course, uh, it's true, I do agree with you that uh, in Africa's uh, biggest asset is, is people. And that also has a number of you know, implications. You're talking about education, you're talking about health. Um, it's talking about the issues of empowerment, entrepreneurship, gender, human rights, lots of um, issues that, that need to be dealt with. Of course, our politicians are very good at signing up and saying our people are our biggest asset. Just as companies do, if you look at IBM and all these other big companies, our people are our biggest asset. Everybody says it. But when you look at what actually happens in practice, a bit, a bit different. Um, the issue of Benin, um, interest rates 25%. When the gov a lot of times, it is the governments, unfortunately, that are crowding out private investment. They are actually going to the banks, borrowing money, and um, if, if you're a bank manager, you own a bank, and you can borrow, uh, lend money to a government, um, you will not bother to go and lend to the private sector. You, you're, you're definitely going to get your money back from the government eventually, and at, at, a, at a nice rate. So, so one of the things that governments have to do is to be, they have to reduce their own dependency, which is a whole uh, raft of issues that they need to deal with in terms of how they manage, how they increase domestic tax revenue, and so on and so forth. So again, you know, complex issues, but a very good point. The issue of um, buying Benin or buying any other, you know, cash, it's not necessarily a question of pride. I think probably um, people are very rational. A lot of times the quality is not there, the price, is not really competitive with imports. So it's really a, a challenge that we have, which is, a, again, an ongoing process. 
to strengthen the competitiveness, the productivity, the, which is what people are very rational. If you give them a, a, a product which is locally made, which is going to last them as long and it's, it's, it's going to satisfy their needs, by and large, they will do it. It's a long process to get there. Um, and, and so this is the work, of course, that, 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 that we, we, we generally do. And this is what I do um, on my day job. Um, and um, yeah, the issue of companies um, paying tax, well, I've said it before, sorry to bore you again. Um, that's a question that you can deal with right here, right now, um, and um, this is over to you. I'm basically saying we do not need to be doing as many of the projects, you know, that, that um, we raise money and little projects here and there. Get some of these political issues resolved. I think we'll have a much better prospect. But the, the way, the paradigm that we're operating in is not going to create the policy space for a lot of the things that we say we want. So, and, by the way, um, even here in Europe, you're going to face the same problems. Gradually, the rights are coming. They're coming for you. And they're going to take all the money and put it in a tax haven. You will not have the money to, to do proper schools, infrastructure, climate change, all of this stuff. We're in it together. Amen. <laughs> Some people are looking like they came and they expected this big debate with fireworks about Africa and the colonialism while we're actually debating this situation in 2030 or even 2050 where there'll be a billion extra people. And it's very complex. And the more you find out, the, the, the more you know that you should really be nuanced and, and try and get your information. So to try and bring it back to to, to that, that, that inclusive development that we were talking about. Stefan, those farmers that you speak to, your, par your partners, what is the most heard argument that you, you hear from them when, you, when you're in Africa and you're, you're discussing this inclusive growth? Uh, maybe to make it a bit personal, I was in, uh, in Ethiopia last year um, and uh, visiting um, an, 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 a number of stakeholders throughout the coffee value chain. There's a most I don't, I'm sure you agree with me that the best coffee comes from Ethiopia, right? So people are growing oh. coffee and they sell it. Some, as so where, where, where's the best coffee? Yeah? Oh, oh, okay, we got a good competition here. I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead, Stefan. <laughs> Let's Pe work with Kenya now. People drink a lot of coffee in Ethiopia and we like to drink a lot of coffee, Ethiopian coffee included, around the world. And uh, there is an interesting phenomenon of farmers there sitting with their coffee and selling it at a price which is higher than the world price uh, to their neighbors and then we wanting them to grow better coffee or becoming more productive and what I'm trying to say here is that what they tell me if you ask me what the farmers tell me is we would we love to become more productive to understand better how we can uh, plant better seeds uh, maintain our trees better but we need to have to we need to to have a broader discussion actually on what this means for in terms of exports and in terms of where the, where the price sits and how we can make a better value out of what we do. Yeah. And that's, I think, the next level if you talk about systemic intervention, that we need to think how you can provide services, and that's what they ask, services which make them a richer farmer. Richer not only in terms of money, but also in terms of uh, uh, resilience, in terms of risk reduction. And, and what type of services are, uh, are, we, are we talking about? Sure. So what we see now is that many companies we work with in these supply chains, they want to provide services beyond the fertilizer or the seed. They want to provide services which also allow the farmer to divest, strangely enough, from only the coffee crop into other crops as well, because that gives a more... Re, uh, reliable supply at the end of the day. Yeah. So these are services which make farmer uh, opportunities bigger beyond the coffee farm only. Yeah. And that's, I think, an interesting development. At least it struck me that the coffee buyers, the coffee traders, they want to work with these farmers because they need one another. And this is the interconnectedness, which goes beyond the simple scheme of we want to buy coffee only. Yeah. It has to do with, we want you to be there in next generations as well. And as we go on in this evening talking about youth and employment, we have to think that through as well, because many of these farmers are 60 and beyond, right? Yeah. And, and other uh, th concrete things that can be done from our side to, 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 to add that value or to get to those services? Well, I think this, this is also in the Netherlands here, and, and I'm, I, myself, I'm also, uh, I live in Amsterdam. Many of us like to, uh, to eat the, the Tony's chocolate, right, nowadays. And how come? Uh, uh, because it's also 
uh, making the value chain, uh, uh, I don't know if you're aware with Johnny Chocolonely, uh, chocolate. Explain Johnny is, Chocolonely, but it's okay. very nice. So this, is, with me. This, is cho this is chocolate basically, which, which is trying with all, on, with all uh, humbleness, trying to actually shorten the supply chain by actually uh, working with, uh, the, with farmers more directly. And that means that the supply chains become more transparent, the pricing becomes more transparent, and what we actually consume here, and that's the interconnectedness, is actually uh, resonates with what is produced somewhere else and okay. makes us able, also mentally able, to pay a higher price. And this is, I think, what we can concretely do, making these supply chains shorter, more transparent, and there's a lot of technology which helps us doing this, but it's also a choice we, we want to make. I would like to thank all three of you. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you so much. Huh? Come on, come on. Yeah, you can. I'll tell you a joke. Just when we ended, somebody put up their hand. <laughs> Maybe in the next uh, round, I would like to introduce uh, our next guest, because um, I don't want to go over time. We will be reflecting on uh, the theme uh, with two uh, European Parliament candidates. And um, the first one is a diplomat, author of the book, The Congo Codes. He lived in Kenya and Congo, was the special envoy for natural resources. He's also a professor by special appointment of foreign trade and development cooperation at Radboud University, Nijmegen. And he is uh, uh, number four on the GroenLinks list for the European elections. His name is Dirk Jan. Okay. And Koch, toch? Yeah. yeah, Dirk Jan Koch, yeah, sorry. I'm human. Um, the, the other guest is, uh, was, no, is a national project leader inclusion at the Dutch police. And before that, she worked in other positions as an expert in the field of diversity and as a board advisor for the municipality of Amsterdam. And apart from that, she's a fashion designer and entrepreneur in the creative industry in Ghana. And she's number three on the D66 list for the European elections. Can we welcome Samira? <laughs> what did you think of our discussion? Here you go. I didn't agree with you. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you said that there was no party, no progressive party left oh in the God. Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I there's, oh there's cool links. I, think I there's thought you had something serious to say. No, no, no. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I do think there are still uh, progressive parties out there. Unfortunately, they don't uh, end up in government. But yeah, uh, let's Keep the microphone close. Unfortunately, they don't end up in government, but I hope that, that it will change if everybody will go uh, to vote. Yeah. Samira Rafaela. Well, um, I, I can satisfy you because there's actually one in government already. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, may I? May, yes, may, but yeah, go but ahead. about the discussion, I, I I liked it very much, and um, especially how do we make it inclusive? So how do we make sure that we cooperate uh, with the African nations in a more inclusive and necessary uh, way? And I think that is one of the most important questions, like how do we work towards an equal partnership? Let's be honest with each other. Frank, how often do you discuss Africa with your political colleagues? Yeah, a lot, to be honest. And, uh, you know, one of the issues we were talking about was uh, tax evasion. Huh? And, uh, uh, I think uh, last week, two weeks ago, the, the annual figures of uh, Shell uh, became clear. They made the biggest uh, profit, uh, 27 billion this time, and uh, uh, a lot of profits from their African uh, oil fields and gas fields. And uh, I was working quite a bit actually on the on the tax evasion issue. And but as a diplomat, you don't have that much means, right? So we were inviting the companies and gently asking them to behave better. Uh, and uh, they said, yes, Mr. Koch, of course, we'll behave better. <laughs> Uh, but then and course, then you turn around and they did this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's why I think also one of the reasons that I actually decided that I think now it's time to go into uh, to politics actually to, to see if we can actually change the rules because with politely asking, uh, I won't do. Yeah. And, and for me also a lot, I mean, it's, uh, it's part of my identity. I mean, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also African, I'm European and African. 
And um, um, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm always thinking about, like how can we especially make this partnership more equal, but how can we also change the mindset and attitude towards uh, the continent Africa? And uh, what I'm trying to do is that through my personal identity, my personal activities also in Africa, I'm trying to organize these dialogues. Excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, we just need to okay. wait till there. Yeah, thank you. I'm trying to organize these dialogues and conversations about uh, the future uh, partnership with, with Africa. Like, for example, um, uh, organizing and bringing together uh, different African diaspora uh, entrepreneurs networks, uh, like I did in 2016, um, and have this discussion about how can we build bridges as, for example, young entrepreneurs coming from the diaspora. Yeah. So you talk a lot about Africa a lot with your in, with your political colleagues. Yes. I'm, how many work. Africans are there in the European Parliament? You meet people from African descent. Black people like me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know the answer. Uh, actually, one. Mm -hmm. Cecil Kienge. Let's give him a round of a, a round of applause. And uh, I can be the second one. So. <laughs> You, you, you guys understand where I'm, where I'm heading, huh? Yes. I try to look up if there were black members of parliament in Germany. There's one man from Ghana. He's been there for ages. You need binoculars to see the others. To me, it doesn't feel as if the issues that are so well uh, articulated yeah. are really entrenched in our political yeah. thinking and institutions. And to get this new narrative with you, the new generation, what's your plan to do that? Yeah. If you were Juncker for, for one day or for the next year, without the dancing and the other crazy stuff he does, what would you do? I mean, to start with, get elected. Um, but you're younger and, now, and from yes, now, today, yeah. Yes, uh, and uh, if so, I mean, first of all, uh, what I already, how I already started in the beginning is that we need to change our mindset and our attitude. That is the first thing that we need to do. So as an individual uh, in the European Parliament or in the European Commission, I really think that we should change the attitude and, and mindset. And then the second thing, I think that if I'd be uh, in the European uh, Commission uh, or in the European <coughs> Parliament, um, there's an interesting momentum coming up. Um, to be concrete, uh, the Cotonou Agreement. Is the Cotonou Agreement um, familiar for, for people sitting here? Okay, so that's basically, for people not knowing the Cotonou Agreement, that's basically uh, a trade agreement uh, between the EU and African countries, but also Carib the Caribbean. Um, and it's set to expire by uh, February 2020. And I think that's a very interesting uh, momentum where we can uh, start changing our attitude and saying, okay, we should uh, get into this together and we should discuss this with Africa. Like what can be the new agreements and terms? Um, this is, uh, uh, I think, a very uh, interesting one that, that, I can, uh, that I would start with. Uh, if I'd be in the European Commission and then, uh, or the European Parliament. Uh, and then the second one is, um, um, is to start about, okay, how can we uh, invest in more education? Uh, but not only like, for example, uh, in, for the youth in Africa, but also, for example, how can we exchange knowledge and education uh, for farmers, for example, in Africa, also given the climate change? Yeah, I would like to build on that. Of course, we need to have fairer agreement with, uh, uh, with Africa, but I think also, and I think the first speaker said that very, very eloquently, there's also a problem in Europe. And the problem in Europe is uh, what we see is that many of our social services in Europe are, are declining. Uh, you know, uh, we have, uh, for instance, we have two little teachers. My kids are very happy about it. They read a lot of Donald Duck comic books uh, during classes when the teacher is ill. But I don't really see that as a good alternative to, to classes. So uh, what you see is that uh, a lot of the companies, uh, they are very smart uh, and, and, they, and they put their, uh, their seat where uh, they have to pay lowest taxes and they compete. Uh, all our, all our, all our uh, countries are competing against each other. So the first thing I would do if I'm the boss, and I think it might take a bit of a while, but when I'm the boss, I will make sure that there's the same profit tax rate for all companies throughout Europe. Let's fix it at 25%. Because now we're all trying, we have this race to the bottom. And uh, yeah. that's really making Europe less inclusive. And if you're not inclusive you're, uh, as a continent, you cannot be inclusive towards another continent. Yeah. Well so then, let's start with ourselves. Okay, but uh, then let's start with ourselves. 
So then we close our eyes and we look into ourselves and we listen to what Chukwu was saying. Repeatedly, he was referring to uh, the responsibility we have to make a change. And whether it's the tax evasion or maybe the, uh, the whole issue of refugees, why do you think most of the parties, okay, you guys are a little bit more progressive, are quite conservative and, and look at these issues from, from, from a what more negative perspective? And how could we change that to get to where Chukwu wants us to be? Well, I, you have to be really honest now yeah. eh, about your, your own gang. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, and you can con uh, check if, you, if I think that I'm not honest, but I think the problem is that a lot of people are quite progressive in their hearts, but uh, they are a bit disillusioned. So they okay. don't uh, come up to vote, yeah. uh, don't show up to vote. So the last European elections, there was 40% of the people who went to vote. And I'm canvassing in uh, neighborhoods, so there's 25, 30% of people going out to vote. If those other 60%, uh, come out to vote, I'm sure that we would have much more progressive politics. So I think really it's um, making sure that people feel included and uh, I think that is a first step. Yeah, and, and to make sure that, that people get out and vote is to, is to first of all uh, make sure that, that first we have a story um, and, and come up with solutions uh, that are really uh, addressing the real issues like social, in, social in, 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 in inequity. Um, that is, that is what, what people are worrying about. They want to know what their position uh, in the workforce are going to be, um, inclusive healthcare, um, inclusive education, and that is the story that we also need to tell as progressive parties, like what are we going to do, and we need to show them that we can. And I think um, that, is, that is especially necessary. But I was trying to find out what your own gang is doing wrong, and not why the people don't show up to vote. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a difficult question, but I, I'm trying to find out how we can, like, what do you yeah. say when the doors are closed? Yeah. And I don't give us the whole version, but what do you say about this issue? What do you mean with this issue? Well, about the fact that what your political leaders say is more to the right than to the left, and how they vote when it comes to, the, to, to, to Africa and even the refugee issues. Holland has gone to the right the past 15 years, including Deze Sester and GroenLinks. Sorry to say. So you're the new generation. Yeah. You don't have to defend their crimes. But you're, you're here to explain to us what, what the future is going to be. Well, the future is going to be us, I think. Yeah. The but what are you going to do different? That's what I want yeah. to know. Well, the next generation, I think, uh, is a generation that is very willing uh, to, to listen to people to ask the question, like, what are you worrying about? And take, for example, my own personal, uh, my, my own personal motivation to get into politics is because I have a story. I can tell a story about not getting equal chances, uh, chances, and I know how it is. I know how it is to be excluded in education. I know how it is to be excluded in the workforce. workforce. Um, I know how it is to be a, a daughter of a man who came from Africa to Europe himself uh, to get equal ch chances, and that motivated my uh, myself really much to get into politics and I think um, uh, that personally uh, makes, me, makes me able to connect and to understand uh, what some of the issues are and I yeah. think that the next generation should be really able uh, to, uh, to connect and to ask questions and to make sure that they can they can transfer uh, uh, these, these uh, necessities of, of, of people into action. Andrew, I'm yeah. gonna, uh, if you allow me, we are very smart people in the room, huh? and I think they all see the two sides of the African story, and a huge potential. You know, people who are extremely smart, well-educated, ready to, uh, uh, to make sure that money uh, gets invested and is well spent. But at the same time, we see that hunger is rising in Africa. And I, uh, and as long as we cannot get the general level of development up, um, the problems uh, will continue to exist, and uh, pr the problem of migration will continue to exist. So I will try to tell the honest story. Come, guys, we need to invest in Africa. Uh, we need to have an equal partnership. Yeah. This will make Africa better off. This will make Europe better off. And I think that's a story. For that example, Dick Jan, would you say today, I'm going to walk into the Deces Assessor office? Yeah, there's room for questions in a bit. And I'm going to propose on camera that we should give migrants a temporary visa and if they can work here and then go back, that, that somewhere in the report they're speaking about a future where 
But you're, but but you're. I think you're taking the wrong example here because I think D66 is is actually already one of the parties that is saying for years that uh, uh, that migrants uh, should have equal rights when it comes to you know participate in the workforce, uh, to to get education, uh, to learn the language. So we are already like saying that we're already trying to do that. I tried my and best. Also in Europe. I'm trying to grill you, but you're too nice and too smart. Who has a question? Because after that we'll. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, name? So my name is Manny and I come from Italy. Um, so we, before we were talking about agriculture and access to markets um, and price competition. So there is this thing called the European Common Agricultural Policy. It's been active for 50 years and it takes out 45% of the EU budget and uh, we, we, as you, you may know, we have been subsidizing farmers in Spain, in France, in Italy, in all European countries for uh, quite extensively. Uh, I always hear this, this story that somehow by subsidizing them, we are uh, we're taking away from African agriculture. Uh, do you think this is a common uh, misconception or actually there is room to improve this common uh, European agricultural policy. Because in the end, it's a bit of a balance. It, it, it's a bit of a dilemma. Are we, are we subsidizing our own agriculture by taking away uh, opportunities for inclusive development? Uh, so what do you think of the future of this policy since when you will be elected, you will have a, a, a say on it? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, was it for me the question? Uh, both of you. <laughs> You fight, go ahead, yeah, both of you. <laughs> Ladies first. No, you yeah. can go first. Okay. Oh my well, God. The, the thing and is, of course, no, I feel very strongly about this. That's why I do straight away, uh, and I'm teaching this also to my students. So, you know, uh, the big issue is, of course, that we have been subsidizing this agriculture. It is becoming less, luckily. But uh, uh, at the same time, now we are forcing, uh, with the new partnership agreements with, uh, with Africa, after Cotonou, we're forcing them to lower, for instance, import tariffs on milk, you know, in the Netherlands we produce a lot of this uh, powder milk, and uh, a lot of Western African countries are still uh, uh, putting import tariffs, and they're earning money with that, and they're protecting their local farmers, but now we say, come on guys, no, you have to lower your import tariffs. And this is what we call very incoherent policy, right? Because on one hand, our development projects uh, are stimulating local agriculture and helping uh, to get uh, the dairy product, uh, products going, but at the same time, we're really pushing down and they're the ways they have to protect their market. So we really have to look at the European uh, policies if we want to solve some of these issues in Africa. But but these are I mean these are exactly I'm I'm losing my but these are exactly uh, uh, the opportunities that I was talking about in the beginning. I think these are one of the the, the terms and agreements that we can uh, uh, we can we can do over again. Uh, incorporation with with African nations and discuss these kind of uh, issues and topics that that needs to be changed. So I think that the, there are opportunities coming up um, uh, to take away unnecessary taxation, but also, for example, trade barriers. Okay. Uh, but but uh, uh, sir, it, it, there's no reason to just talk because no one will hear you. If 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 you. Yeah. It, if, if you want to say something, you can raise your hand. Uh, there, there is room. Do you want to say something? Yeah, but th then we will find you. No, w w w one second. And then we'll do one more question, and then yeah. we, we will round issue, up. The main issue is, of course, the Cotonou uh, is a very important uh, agreement. It has been a very dirty thing. And uh, the, trade, uh, the, the trade protection of Europe should be balanced. On it towards Africa, not yes. the other way around. We we, we yes. killed the chicken industry, uh, for instance, in yeah. Western Africa. Yes. To give a nice example, uh, that is maybe more important uh, to Africa yes. than the whole taxation of. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It needs to be more inclusive and equal, and that that is where we need to start with. Yeah. Definitely. Take okay. away these obstacles and barriers. Unnecessary. Too cool. Would you have a question to them as, as aspiring politi uh, professional politicians now, maybe being elected? Uh, w w well, um, I, I think you, you were, for me, you were really 
pressing in on the issues, which is, which is what are you going to do differently um, to engage? The fact is that for lots of reasons, it would appear that people are going more towards the right, that these issues that would have been common would have, you know, are, are they moving away from them. So it's also to really understand, because that's the real politics, and I'm not saying it's easy, and I think I commend you for trying it, but, but, but the how of you actually going to broaden that base for a more inclusive um, politics is, is, would it not be that you, as you say, that you really explain this um, that it's not just about caring about Africa in some, you know, some because we colonized them in the past or whatever, but actually because these are the issues that we're all dealing with. I just wonder if you could maybe elaborate how, you know, you're going to frame that in a way, as you say, that connects with a broader base. Because if we don't have a broader base, then it's just a nice kind of productive politics, have a nice coffee in a cafe, but it doesn't really um, become the order of the day. Thank you so much. It's a difficult question, but... No, I thought it was actually... Uh yeah, pretty oh, well, easy. go ahead. <laughs> no, what I think is that often uh, people have the wrong enemies in mind. You know, when they are voting, they think it is the mistake of the, the Polish plumber or the mistake of the African immigrant, but, uh, and uh, that's why they are voting more to the right. But I think that we, as aspiring politicians, have to make clear that actually they are not the problem. They are just uh, being used as scapegoats. It's more the system, which is unfair, which is not social enough, which is not uh, inclusive enough. And I think if... At least when we are canvassing, we're trying to explain uh, that uh, story, and then people realize that indeed uh, uh, you cannot blame those individuals. Actually, it's the, it, it is uh, the, the uh, more inclusive policies which are needed. Yeah. But I also think that um, we should recognize problems. We should recognize them, and we should not deny them. Uh, I also think that uh, to bother our base is to also sometimes start with, you know what, you're right, we have a problem. We have a problem with, uh, we have social issues, we have social problems, and we take you seriously in this. And um, so empathy, I think that in the first place, because what I also often see is that we often stick to pragmatic solutions. But, but, but empathy with who? Empathy with, uh, with, 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 your, with your base, with your people. With the people with, who don't with, want black people your, to be... With your society. Uh, no, but he's talking about how to broaden your, yeah. broader, uh, broader your base. Yeah. Um, so I'm answering specifically to that. To that, yeah. And, um, um, and I also think that often we stick to pragmatic solutions. While people want to know is, uh, people want to know is how are you going to make my life better uh, in uh, for the daily, daily practice? How are you going to make sure that I'm having better health care or better education? And I think that we should... Uh, look more into solutions that address these important values for people and that we should um, uh, spread that story and that we should take that very seriously by starting to recognize that, they are, that there are problems, there are issues. And I want to listen to you. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, I wish you a lot of success yeah. with, the, with the coming elections. Um, I, th I think both Samir and I will be around tonight. If you have additional questions, we are happy to, to engage with you further. Yes. Yeah. It's a, yeah, well, it's a, um, I'm on time. We're going to the last session. And I think it's also uh, very interesting because we'll, uh, we'll also be ending the evening with some reflection. And in our... Uh, on, the, on, on, uh, on the evening from the start till, till where we have uh, reached at this moment. Um, we will talk about um, the EU-Africa relations, as I said also because of the fact that we had Juncker and his speech, and, and we want to again end in the continent uh, with uh, two guests, Patricia Muteu from uh, Kenya. She is an elected member of the Nairobi Assembly, and she wants to change the political culture of Kenya, let's give her a warm welcome. welcome. And um, last but not least, uh, somebody whose expertise lies mainly in the field of migration and development. In, his, in uh, this capacity, he was also the co-chair and the chief rapporteur for the various meetings of the Global Forum for Migration and Development. Um, he's director of G, uh, GK Partners and founding director of ADEPT. Uh, a British Gambian development expert who is also the visiting professor at the London School of Economics, Jibril Fahl.
Thank you so much for coming here today. Um, I would like to start with, um, as I said, uh, the EU-Africa relations. Um, what did you think when you heard uh, Juncker say that Africa is the future? But it is. <laughs> it is the future. And that's why we are having... F but he also called it the twin continent of Europe. Yes, it is. It has equal potential as Europe. And that's why everyone, even the East, is looking towards Africa. But because while, it is the future. But while everything Europe is doing is just trying to stop the migration from Africa. And then he says this. Yeah, that is the perception again. Because that's a very small uh, percentage that tries to, 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 to immigrate. But there's a bigger picture when it comes to Africa, yeah, yeah apart from migration. Jibiri, what did you think when he said that? Well, Junko was, as usual, wrong. <laughs> oh, finally. <laughs> yeah, you have to speak, speak in the microphone very well. Yeah, yeah, it's... it's uh... So this one is for Brussels. Oh. <laughs> Juncker was, as usual, wrong. Why, explain, why was he wrong? Africa is not the future. Africa is the past, the present, and the future. When we talk usually about the African diaspora, we classify it into different categories. And the first category is the primordial diaspora, and that is all of humanity. All of humanity are Africans. They descended from the primordial Eve. Yeah? So Africa is the past. The present economic power of Europe is predominantly derived from the exploitation of Africa. Africa is the future because of demogra demographic changes and other geopolitical changes. So he's wrong on that basis. On the question or the comment that Europe is the twin continent of Africa, he's wrong. Oui. He is wrong because Europe is not a continent. Europe is, Eastern, is, is Western Asia. <laughs> Continents are pieces of land surrounded by oceans. Yeah. Islands are pieces of land surrounded by seas or water. But why is it that we are all amazed to think or to realize or to hear that Europe is not a continent. It is so much not a continent geographically that the map that we know about is not a fair representation of the actual volume and the size of land. So there's a version called Peter's Projection which is a fairer representation. And if you look at Peter's projection and you look at the standard map, what do you see? Europe being far bigger than what it is really, and Africa particularly being smaller. For a very long time, except that Sudan is divided, but you could have put most of Europe in Sudan. <laughs> to this day, you can put most of Europe in Sudan and Congo and have spare land. <laughs> How many countries do we have in Europe? This talk about, even the talk in Africa, the, one of the problems of having too many countries, the description for it is a European word. It's called balkanization, the breaking of small countries. There are some European countries, on a day that I'm feeling very fit, I can walk across it. <laughs> Did I, and did I'm I, a lazy man. I forgot to tell you that the, the, the professor is also a stand-up comedian, and he will... <laughs> he, he will... Uh, <laughs> he will give you a show. Could, could, thank you for, 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 for saying this, but could you get back to the strategic uh, aspect of, 
of Juncker saying this because mm -hmm. they didn't make themselves bigger for no reason. They were scared a long time ago when they made that map. Yes. Um, so why is he saying this? Well, it's not only him. It's because of all of the way we are educated. This is an American psychologist called Naim Akbar who once said that particularly for Africans, but many who came from a colonial education, that if you do not have another source of information, the more educated you are, the bigger the fool you become. Because the whole system is rigged to tell a story. And in the women's liberation movement, that's why they used to refer to history as his story. And women had to tell her story. It's a similar sort of thing. But and you, and this, I won't go into the psychology of No, uh, No, no, because we'll be here tomorrow, and which is good. <laughs> yes. I'm here, as I said, I, I'm school for me. Yes. Patricia, um, could you tell us a bit about the road you took uh, to get into politics? Because we just heard from politicians uh, in the Netherlands who were going for the European Parliament. But tell us a bit about your story in Kenya. Actually, what inspired me was uh, be prior to joining politics, I did, um, I was consulting for USAID on radicalization and extremism. And uh, this project actually targeted youth from informal settlements. And as I traversed Nairobi, I realized there was no proper uh, representation of maybe the low income uh, people. So, and I thought, I can also do it instead of blaming, you know, being on the other side, let me try and see what other side has to offer. And actually that's what inspired me to get into politics, actually to learn government processes and see how we can, you know, form a synergy between our people and the politicians. Yeah, and every day it's been a learning experience. Things are not the way I expected them to be. There's a lot that I've learned and there's a lot that needs to be done. If at all we're gonna exploit this um, relationship you're talking about, EU and maybe AU collaboration, there's a lot that needs to be done. Yeah. Because for any business to prosper, it needs a good democracy. It needs an environment where it can thrive. So when you're over here, if you don't support that, then definitely we create an imbalance. When, when, when we think of, of, of Africa and or Kenya, it's, oh, the, the elections, oh, the corruption, it's such a chaos. You did what Obama did, you went from door to door. Yes, I did. And you went up against these, some of them, thugs. Yeah. How did you do that? You are here physically, so you survived. <laughs> yes, I, I think I just did it. And you know, this perception, their thugs. I, by the way, I represent a ward that has one of the largest slums in the world. It's called Madare. And it wasn't easy for a woman to go door by door and ask for votes. It wasn't easy, but again, I will say, it's just conditioning. At that time, there was not that fear, you know? The, the spirit was too big and high. I chose not to see the negatives. And that's how I did it. And that's how... So actually, actually, that's why I asked you, you were busy changing the narrative by doing what you were doing, just going... Yeah, it, it all yeah. started here. Yeah. I, I didn't see the gangs, I didn't see the fears. It, it just like... W w what are our goals? There is the goalpost. How do I score? Professor, you, you, you've been around the world and recently been back in, in your beloved Gambia. Mm -hmm. uh, this part of the show was about how we can change the narrative. She, she, we speak a lot about framing, I, I exaggerate a bit. Yes. Um, what do you think, what could you give us based on the, the years of your own experience, whether it's farming in Ghana, being in London and now back in Gambia, when it comes to that narrative of, of EU and Africa? Um, the narrative, it's all about 
how, as humans, we take stories and how we internalize it. But just to comment on Patricia's sort of actions and what yeah. she did, yeah. she forgot to mention an important element, that's also that she's young. So you had, and young people and youth and their involvement in the narrative is extremely important. Why? George Bernard Shaw, the Irish writer, used to say that youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> because they have all the energy and the power. He was assuming that they didn't have the wisdom. By the time you have the wisdom, you don't have the power. But what you have now is young people with all of that energy and the power and borrowing the wisdom. So that makes it extremely yeah. Yeah. meaningful. And whenever young people stand up, you begin to see significant changes. Yeah. In terms of the overall narratives, it's a, it's a job that should not be given to academics or politicians. It's a job that needs to be given to perhaps the creative people. Because most of the things we believe and sometimes die for have nothing whatsoever to do with fact or rationality. It has to do with emotions and perceptions. Going back to the story about the map of the wall and Peter's projection, why do you think anyone would go through the trouble of doing it? I was asking you, yeah. Because there is a school of thought that says that we perceive the world at three levels. Reality, this is the one we think we rationally understand. We are in a hall, in a building, in Amsterdam, having a discussion on a Friday evening with a very interesting moderator. <laughs> that may be reality. The surrealists, by the way, I'm a, that's my favorite art form. The surrealist would take what seemed to be reality and subvert it. So you may have, of course, you know the famous painting, Ceci n'est pas une pipe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And of course, of course, the Belgians are the best surrealists. If I was being rude, I'll even say that the country is surreal. <laughs> but that's a painting of what looks like a pipe. And it says, this is not a pipe. And you start looking at it. And you begin to question, is it really a pipe? Because it's questioning your fundamental response to reality. Now, you have, in my own theory, another version of perception that exists. That's what I call super reality, where certain things we just take it to be true and have never even ventured to question it. For example, that map of the world. Yeah. You're brought up on it, you internalize it, you believe it without ever having to question it until somebody call your attention to it. So unfortunately, those are, that's how our brains are wired. And this is why the advertising world are successful to every day, you, uh, you wake up minding your own business and the advertiser, used by the capitalists, by the way, who I, I have grudging respect for. For the capitalists? Yeah. Okay. I have grudging respect yeah, I, for I the hear you. capitalists. Yeah, yeah. And every day you wake up minding your own business, they would sell you things that you do not want or need with money that you do not have. And when you feel so bad about being hard, they do it to you again tomorrow. <laughs> and they succeed. So it's a creative job, as far as I'm concerned. I'll leave it to them. To the creative people. Yeah. Patricia, some 
Some people say that uh, the only way we can wake up uh, the Europeans is by scaring them that all the Africans will be on our doorstep. Uh, I think there must be other ways uh, to get people to engage in this new narrative. Or do you think that there's no n need for it? Let Africa just do their thing and we go ahead. Uh, definitely. Uh, yeah, we need to do our thing. We need also to encourage business among ourselves. Okay, do more of intra-business. But again, um, we need also to welcome visitors and see how we can collaborate in order to win. Uh, for instance, there's when they were talking about agriculture, you look at Africa just, you know, as food basket and you forget, of course, we have innovation. We have all these minerals, we have all these things, all raw, these raw materials, instead of, ex, uh, you know, exporting them, we should set up industries that actually can benefit the local um, population. Okay, we have country like, uh, like in Kenya, uh, we grow lots of flowers for you, for, for Netherlands. Okay, how sustainable is that? Is it really a need or is it luxury in a country that after a few months we start, you know, doing publicity about famine and hunger? So as European, are you helping us to balance? And clearly this is still exploitation, honestly. And, and how do you engage the youths in Kenya to, do, to, to, to be aware of this EU African na narrative? Like I said, we need to emphasize more on education and because we have a, a a large population that it's not, uh, they, they don't have proper civic education. So they cannot put relevant question to the governments. And ignorance, you know, promotes poverty. So if we set up a system that even the, you know, the woman who's never stepped in a class that can understand what they need from the government, then we will be winning. If Africa wins in terms of democracy and it puts the right leaders in place, there'll be a lot of stability and also it will be a platform for EU to exploit all these benefits and have a, 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 you know, a bit of transition when it comes to, to business. And that will promote fairness, honestly. Okay. Okay, because actually all these countries um, benefit because most African countries are in chaos, yeah? So there is no equal, we give more, but we get less. Thank you. And we have countries supporting that kind of system. For instance, you decide what we need. And why is that? Because Maybe most of African leaders are corrupt, so it's easy to negotiate deals. Deals, by the end of the day, will only make Africa more poorer. Is that fair? If you people put your people into question as to why we are doing this, is it equal, is it fair? And the applaud the, the system of fair trade. And that needs to be, you know, encouraged when it comes to, you know, even signing all these big deals. What is in for us? Is it fair? Or do we, do you just decide, no, I think right now, Africa, we need to do this and this and this. So let's promote it. And like I'll say, it all starts with advertisement. Oh, let's try and do HIV awareness, then after that, then we have ARVs, then after that, then we have this. We're actually forced to consume what we don't need. So if you are aware and you have a good system that can put good leaders in, in, in place, everyone will win. Like Chuku said, we're in this together. Yeah. Thank you. Um, We only have a few minutes left, and the professor will end the night with some stand-up comedy and knowledge. Um, who has a question or a remark? Now is the time that you can, the gentleman, you can say your last words. Yeah, yeah, take it. Uh, she likes to hold the microphones, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. My name yeah. is Alt Spijkers. I worked for 25 years in Asia and 10 years in Africa, on which is seven years in the heart of darkness, DR Congo. And Mr. Chairman, what I miss this evening is 
why in some countries it was possible to, to lift people out of poverty. And I have to mention Vietnam, a long war, a lot of problems. I worked in China, Cambodia, Bangladesh. All these countries made progress. Why? I think there was a vision, there was a policy, and there was an investment in the technology. Kofi Annan was here one and a half year ago on the Afsluitdijk, on a big meeting. And he, he used the word leapfrogging. Can Africa, in one another way, profit of the new technologies and get the thing right? Because we all agree this evening, poverty has to get, the, the, the Africa gets out of the poverty. And my lesson, Mr. Chairman, to, 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 to conclude is, why in Vietnam, by investment in technology and bringing capital to that country, it was possible to lift it out of poverty? When I was in Vietnam in the 80s, we brought coffee breeders from Kenya to the high plateau in Vietnam and started to breed coffee. So that South-South cooperation, which was not, I think, tabled this evening, and I would also ask this gentleman from the Nijmegen University, where I work myself, that we have to take also in perspective. It is clear that we cannot have too many people here in an ordinary way. There are millions of Bangladeshis working in the Middle East, but the thing is organized. Yeah? And I think that is important also, discipline in our thinking. Okay, that was, thank you very much. And sorry for, for not entailing the South-South. I think we missed a lot of other things as well. Uh, but it's good that you mentioned that. Do you have a, sh a short reaction to, to the gentleman's words? Yes, very, I think the comments are spot on on many levels. But I wanted to pick on, on the point on the technology leap. In the past 20 years or so, the most important, perhaps, development in Africa has been mobile phones. They have created maybe millions of jobs, facilitated the creation of new industries and new sectors. And in places like, for example, if you take mobile money, which is applying financial transactions day to day on using mobile phones, Africa is the world leader. It's not Europe, it's not Asia, it's not North America, it's not Latin America, it's Africa. And in Africa, the competition is between two countries. One country is Kenya. People would say M-Pesa Kenya yeah. is the world leader in mobile money. The only country that would challenge that claim is Somalia. Mm. And my money is on Somalia although I'm a good friend of Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> but that has happened through technology leap, yeah. whereby the telephone system on a grid wasn't working, there's not even electricity, and diaspora entrepreneurs, diaspora entrepreneurs, a Rwandese working in Congo, and a Sudanese who's lived in Egypt and in the United Kingdom, Mo Ibrahim, effectively brought industries, particularly Mo Ibrahim, with Celtel, and that just changed the game. The game now the Africa. world can learn from Africa from the mobile banking and the business. Indeed. Okay, but who else? Because let's do, let's say, two, two more people who have something to say or a question. Yes, the gentleman in the back. Your name? Uh, hi, I'm Saul. I'm actually from one of the uh, co-organizers of the event, uh, the Netherlands Institute of Multi-Party Democracy. And I'd just like to know what uh, both our panelists think about uh, strengthening the political sectors uh, and that being a way that Europe can make a more equal relationship with Africa by opening up a uh, more accountable and inclusive uh, political sector by helping parties over there through dialogue and uh, other measures such as that. I'd be very keen to hear your input on that area of development. As Ali, uh, my Ali comments, it said, if we really need to strengthen political party, we need an informed electorate. Only then they can put people who deserve and people who represent transparency. Not unless we have that, then we have a population that doesn't understand what it needs, and then we have another population of political class that will exploit the others. So every year, 
after every five years, both party, parties will not be satisfied. So you vote him out or you vote her out, then bring someone else thinking that they will impact change. But it's the same, same problem. But if we could have a system where electorates can, you know, put the leader into accountability, we all win. Thank Africa you. gets a, 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 a get stable, it creates a good environment for anyone to do business. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Elver. Um, I was listening to the comment of this gentleman saying Bangladesh, Vietnam. And then I heard Africa. And one of the things I was thinking all the time, also with our politicians, I think we have to stop talking about Africa, those 59 countries, and start talking about the countries we identify. Because every time when we talk about Africa, there is this idea about Africa, and we know that there are countries where people are hungry, but we don't know where the people are really doing good. So one of the narratives we need now, so that's why I loved you, Professor, because you're not a stand-up comedian to me. With what you're saying, you're trying to, to trigger us on a different levels of our thinking. Because one of the things we need is a really a different perspective on Africa. I came here tonight because one of the things I wanted to learn was that I'm a black man. I was interested in knowing where I have to put my money in Africa and not in Europe. So what I want to know, not talk about Africa, I want to know which, where are the places where I have to put my black money, which I, which I earn here, to put it in the countries where we think that the development will be. Because talking about black people, Every time, every day we see here in the Netherlands, we see we are enjoying the excellence of white people. And what I want every day is to enjoy the black excellence of black people so we stop with a narrative of people of Africa being poor, not knowing, and everything. Just let's talk about the 59 different countries. And that's also what I want to ask our politicians. Because I don't believe that one of our political parties will really change the narrative. Because the narrative, you only mentioned it once, we are like fish in a bowl where colonialism and all the, 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 the institutes are built on that. So if we say we want to change that, I think we really have to look at something. And you started with that. You said about healing. It wasn't something like healing, I think we need to talk in this country really about what's happened, not to be a, a slachtoffer, victim, not to be a victim, but really to start to change our narratives because in the 60s I've learned, and that was for me very important, black is beautiful and that's why I'm here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And thank you for speaking. Mr. Elber, thank you for, no, no, let's take some time to just, uh, thank you for speaking from your heart. I think uh, the, the, both of you should react and, 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 and then uh, we can. Straight up, we can invest in Kenya. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Kenya. Yeah, you can invest in Kenya, you don't need to look further. <laughs> yeah, Karibu. Okay. Yeah, well, like he said, we're very good with money. Well, I, It's a first in the world. There, there's some other, there's some other countries as well, but but um, but Professor, speaking to what he said about the 90, the 59 countries, there, there are some presidents who say we should have more integration of African countries, yeah. so then we would have less countries than the 59. Yeah. What, what's your reaction when he when he when he speaks of the 59 well, and the Africa? Well, I think it's 55. The members of the African Union is 55, including Western Sahara or Sahrawiya. They were 54 for many years, but Morocco has come back okay. 
so it's so um, integration is one of the big topics of the African Union. So they have big ambitious plans that people have commented before. The problem, and the African Union acknowledges it, is its ability to implement. But all of the plans they have, the um, Agenda 2063, they have plans for whole manner of integration across the board, infrastructure, mm. road networks, and the plans are there. In fact, I am right now working with them, helping them to create um, what's called the Africa Diaspora Investment Fund. So in a way, one has to balance it. You see, the thinking about sometimes to bring them all as one Africa is because there's a big disparity. Every fifth African is a Nigerian. <laughs> so Nigeria is about 20% of the population. So the might of Nigeria is so big. So then you can see, if you're going just doing it country by country, it will be lopsided. So there's the bit of responsibility sharing, whereby then there's support to a small country like Gambia. But if you were asking the question, where do you invest, there are about 20 to 25 African countries where when you put your money in, you have big high return and it's safe with no problems. About 20 questions. You will, oh, you'll, countries, and of course, of Kenya, course Kenya you, is in you, there. You'll write them down for him? Yes. Uh, just because of time, sure. real quick, we were having dinner and, mm. and, and the professor said something that baffled me. Yeah. He, and I'll ask you guys, how much do you think uh, the, the, the total sum of, of, of ex export was it for the whole African continent? Yeah, income, income for the in, maybe you can say it yourself. Yeah, the annual income, GDP for the whole Africa. of Africa. Although, don't tell them the answer. No, no, no. <laughs> this is why I'm bringing it up. Yeah. What do you think? Because Compare I can to... address that in the closing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I think it's time to close because he'll <laughs> give you the answer. Yeah. Let's, um, because cause I'm looking at the, the time uh, my boss is in the back. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Okay. <laughs> See? I have, that's the boss. Can we give her a round of applause? That's Ayan. Ayan. Without Ayan, <laughs> it would be a mess. <laughs> Patricia, applause for Patricia. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I would like to give, one yeah. Start. And give a round of applause to the professor for ending our day. Indeed, very expensive to be poor. The indignity, that comes with it, the deprivation it causes, the erosion of potentiality, the cost literally. If you're poor, things are more expensive for you to buy. And the weak bargaining power that you have, your hand is very weak. I heard in the discussion about worries and concern about tax evasion and illicit financial transfers. I agree about the horrors of tax evasion. But I can tell you that at least 30 African countries compete amongst themselves to give tax breaks, meaning you don't have to evade it. They will take it off. You can come and not pay taxes. And why is that so? It's because of the weak bargaining hand of a poor country. Shell's annual income, somebody mentioned, was 27 billion. The profit, 27 billion. That is more than the annual income of Zambia, which was 25 billion in 2017. Lagos, the state of Lagos, its income is one and a half times the income of all of Zambia because Lagos turnover, Lagos the capital 
at least the economic capital of Nigeria, is $34 billion. Kenya is $75 billion. Ethiopia is $80 billion. Morocco is $110 billion. Sudan, with its oil, is about $100 billion. You put all of these, it's about the equal, the income of the small Netherlands. So Netherlands is Ethiopia, Kenya, Morocco, Sudan put together. Why am I making this point is we have to put it in context when we say, at least for that narrow and crude and vulgar declaration of what is poverty when you're comparing Africa and Europe. If you take the biggest economies in Africa, Nigeria, $375 billion. South Africa, $350 billion. Egypt, $235 billion. And then you add every order, all 54, 55 countries, you end up getting something between 2.5 to 2.8 trillion a year. That is about the income of the United Kingdom. So the annual income on GDP calculation of all of Africa is about the same as the United Kingdom. And of course, the income of Germany is one and a half times because it is at 3.7 trillion. Sorry, I, did I say billion? I meant to say trillion. Yes, 2.5 trillion, and Germany is 3.7 trillion. So the gap is big. So when we are talking about equal partnerships, do you see equality there? There isn't. So that's why when we are having negotiations, it's not equal, it cannot be at least on that economic basis. So that means we need to find other means of engagement. Because if it goes crudely on let's talk business, there's no discussions really. Which reminds me, which, how then do you try to get a more fundamental handle on the problems? For the longest time, People believed that famines are caused by the absence of food. Would anybody disagree with that? That famines happen when there's no food and people become hungry. Well, that's common sense, isn't it? Until the Indian economist Amartya Sen told us that it's not true. Famines are not caused by the absence of food. Famines are caused by the absence of food security. And this is the structural basis that allow people to acquire food. So in a way, the economic deprivation we're seeing is less the absence of decent jobs, more the absence of chances for sustainable and appreciative livelihoods. And why is that happening? The Reverend Desmond Tutu used to say that the white man came to our land bringing a Bible, and he asked us to close our eyes and pray. When we opened our eyes, we were holding the Bible, and they had taken the land. <laughs> and that is, struck, that is important. In fact, in this relationship between Africa and Europe, as a British European, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of Europe to thank Africa for centuries of aid and financial inflows. Every year, every year, Africa is a net provider of finances in Europe. But of course, look at what we're talking about. You are rich or we are rich because Africa is poor. 
So Rodney, what, uh, Rod, the, uh, what's, uh, Walter Rodney was indeed correct. Now, some final points on some practicalities. What can we do? Juncker, Jean-Claude Juncker, is right on some big important things. The European Commission is more progressive than the European Council because the technicians there and the technocrats do make some very important points. Unfortunately, they are not always able to implement it because their political masters never allow them and there's a whole lot of short-termism. But still fundamentally remembering Desmond Tutu and the land, why is that important? Because the factors of production have not changed. We have argued a lot in economics since the classical period, but it's about how you distribute surplus. It is not about the fundamental factors of production. And what, what are those factors? Land. The important thing about land now is with the new computer age and the information age, it is for the first time possible to create land. The reason why land appreciates value an American humorist once said, land is expensive because God had stopped making it. That is why it's expensive. But now, in fact, we can make land and that cyberspace. So there's a hint there. And Africa is showing progress and promise in some of the work. I've given the example of Kenya and Somalia. In Nigeria, the, the, the invention of a whole industry around making films called Nollywood, creating billions of dollars every year and hundreds of thousands of jobs. On labor, we have to stick to the rules about decent jobs and decent pay. The International Labor Organization have spelt it out. There are regulations. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing else to debate. African countries and European countries would, should say, this is what we would do, and no discussion. Oftentimes, I say that we are over-principled and underperforming. So on these principles, we have it. To me, I don't want to discuss it again. Let's do it, or let's leave up to the shame that we're not doing it. So for big corporations like um, Shell, making 27 billion in profit and having staff who you would consider being paid wages that are perhaps not what you would call decent. The last two items, capital. So some of the finances that Europe has as part of its development program I think there should be an emphasis on whatever financing it gives, it gives financing that also goes into regenerative and productive activities, that is capital, rather than gosh. How many of you have received European financing before? It is so damn painful <laughs> to manage. It's so painful and sometimes there's no logic or sense to it, but you have to obey it. So there's room for that to be changed. It's just a matter of decision. And finally, entrepreneurship. The three factors of production are brought together by the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur is no longer just the person who takes the risks, but the person who mobilizes the resources. And there is a whole lot of enterprising and entrepreneurship in Africa. Take the so-called irregular migrants who do not come, who are not wanted in Europe. They are some of the greatest entrepreneurs. They find resources which are hard to get by. They work out routes that even tour operators cannot work out. They take the risk, knowing in some cases that they would die, all to venture for a better life. And think of that word, a venture. It is both a migration word and a business word. So I agree with one of our guests earlier who says that we should also borrow from business and use those tools to change not only the narrative, but the reality and the desperation of poverty.
Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor. And in no way was I trying to be disrespectful when I called you a comedian. I learned a lot from comedians at times. So I would like to thank all of you for coming and, and uh, taking time to listen to all of us. I hope you enjoyed and come to us. Uh, we'll be at the bar. Um, I have one, one more thing to say, and that is that uh, this month um, uh, there will be articles published about Africa 2030 on the site of viceversaonline.nl. Hope to see you next time. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. And thank you to all the guests.